I'm Charles Overby, the uh, chairman of the Overby Center for Southern Journalism and Politics, and I'm delighted to welcome you here. And I'm delighted to welcome our uh, broad television audience as well. Uh, it's really a great uh, panel that we have uh, planned here this afternoon to talk about uh, energy, economic development, and the TVA. Oxford is uh, proud to be hosting the TVA Board of Directors here this week. Richard Holworth, a uh, widely and worldly uh, acclaimed independent bookstore owner, is a member of the TVA Board. He's with us here today. And Richard, we're glad you're here. And I think it was a little bit of your influence that brought the TVA to Oxford. I thought it was the first time in the long history of the TVA that it met here. But Richard assured me that they met here about uh, in how long ago, Richard? 2002. So we're glad uh, to have the TVA back, although the TVA leadership is completely different. So welcome. And uh, in that regard, Bill Johnson is here. He is what I would call still the new uh, CEO and president of the TVA. He joined uh, the TVA uh, January the 1st. He came from the Carolinas. He was the CEO of uh, Progress Energy, uh, headquartered in North Carolina, served North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, any of Georgia? None of Georgia. None of, none of Georgia. And he brings a lifetime of uh, experience in power uh, and in leadership uh, executive ranks. Uh, right uh, next to me is uh, David Rumgardner. David is president and CEO of the Community Development Foundation in Tupelo. He and Bill work together at Progress, and so they've been regaling each other with abuse and stories, and uh, uh, we'll see how that plays out in the panel discussion. <laughs> but David's been in the economic development business all your life. All my career. All your career. David uh, uh, got his education at Auburn, if you can, I oh, know <laughs> that's a terrible thing for a moderator to say. Got his education at Auburn and at uh, Southern Mississippi. Uh, Bill got his education at um, Duke as uh, in history, and then at the University of North Carolina in law school. Uh, got his law degree there, so he's got the Carolinas covered. And uh, David Copenhaver, he's uh, got his economics degree at South Carolina. He was the highest ranking American at the Toyota plant over in Tupelo and has spent uh, about 16 years at Toyota before he retired. And he's been in the economic development business 24 years. And he was a central player in the Toyota plant coming to Mississippi. And then we're here on the campus, we have to have an academic. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> one that's knowledgeable, Dr. Josh Gladden, is uh, the go-to person, I'm told, here at Ole Miss on alternative energy issues. His actual title is uh, director of the National Center for Physical Acoustics. He's associate professor of physics and astronomy here at Ole Miss, and he got his education at uh, Penn State, among other places, Montana also. But uh, So we've got a really distinguished panel here, and we're gonna try to have a conversation among us and then with you. And I think we'll have some fun and hopefully we'll learn something along the way. Bill, I wanted to start with you since you're still new. And you know, in the South, when you go to a new place, you're new for a long time. <laughs> and so uh, you're gonna be new at the TVA, I guess for a while longer. Uh, but even though you spent your life in power uh, development, uh, I wonder if there's anything uh, 11 months later that you know now about the region and or TVA that you didn't know when you accepted the post? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel, a distinguished group. Um, yeah, when I joined TVA almost a year ago, I thought TVA was a large utility company. And I've come to the realization that that's really an enabling function of what TVA really does, which is improve the quality of life for the region. Uh, when you go back to 1933 and you read what Roosevelt said when he proposed it, he said, power is really a secondary matter. And what really you're supposed to do is improve the quality of life and give people in the valley 
the chance to be citizens that they otherwise wouldn't have. So that's been a, uh, a good awakening for me about what we're really doing. Uh, you know, the people of the region, uh, they're like most people in the South, unpretentious, straightforward, nice. So that part I knew about. But the Valley and the TVA's role, uh, I've been pleased to find out what it really is, because it's a high calling, I think. Well, it is. And uh, you mentioned uh, energy and economic development. And those are really two, uh, two important responsibilities of the TVA that go beyond perhaps what other public utility companies do. In 1959, um, Congress quit funding, as you know, the uh, energy side of it. And then in, I guess, 99, they quit funding the economic development side of it. Uh, is TVA, uh, I mean, you're really, are you fish or fowl? You're, you're independent, but you still have to go to Congress and testify. How does that relationship with Congress in particular uh, play out as it relates to your trying to lead this region in the areas you're responsible for? You described it well. It's almost like a sphinx-like creature. We're neither fish nor fowl. We are owned by the government. We have no appropriations. Actually, we're cash flow positive to the government. Uh, we give them money every year. We do have to get budgets um, filed with the OMB and the Congressional Budget Office. We do have oversight in the Senate and the House Committee. Uh, so it's sort of loosely being associated with the government until they have an issue. And then it's like being really part of the government. <laughs> well, they always have issues, Bill. And, you know, if you were just uh, uh, the CEO of a private company, You'd have a hard enough job trying to figure out what your energy sources are going to be 10 years from now. So as I have read about the TVA energy sources, to just in round numbers, kind of wrap my head around it, about a third coal, uh, about a third nuclear, about 20% uh, natural gas, and about 10% hydro. Um, wind and uh, the others don't really even round off. I know you're going to buy some wind from the Midwest. Looking out 10 years, what should this region be looking to the TVA in terms of where you're going to get your energy from? It's a great question and one we're actually going to talk about at the board meeting this week. Um, our objective is to do a couple things. Low cost energy, the link to consumers in the region and business development, economic development. So low cost energy, environmental stewardship, which we have a bigger role to play than I think than most private or publicly owned utilities. We have a different function uh, and the economic development that goes with those. So when we think about that, 10 years from now, I think roughly we would be 40% nuclear, 20% coal, 20% gas, and 20% hydro, renewables, and efficient, which is really a diversified portfolio our environmental footprint goes way down, uh, and we're still pretty competitive economically. So I think in 10 years, that's about what it looks like. I think conventional power, including fossil fuels, are with us for another century in this country. Mm -hmm. But using them smartly, using them less, if we can, I think is a good idea. David Copenhagen, you were involved uh, integrally in Toyota coming here uh, to Tupelo. Help us understand the role of TVA and power uh, to Toyota making a decision like this. Did it have any role at all, or was it a huge role, or what? No, it, it always has a role. I'm, actually, I didn't have anything to do with the decision to locate Tupelo in Mississippi. Um, mine was more starting a plant, getting the plant started. But I spent uh, about three years negotiating with TVA. On our, uh, on our power requirements because a lot of people uh, will remember we went through a period where we actually suspended the project and they had already made a huge investment in uh, infrastructure for Toyota so we spent it wasn't three years but we spent about eight months uh, negotiating we finally came up with a contract I, I don't think the uh, it's the first time I know that we ever signed a long-term contract and we didn't have a plan on when the plant was going to start but we did, uh, and they were very cooperative with us. But power is, in economic development, power has always been, is always a key, maybe in some industries more than others. And it's not just the availability of power, and it's not just the cost of power. And 
My plant in West Virginia, for example, is more the reliability of power than it was anything else because it was a huge machining operation. So just to give you an example, uh, on our cylinder block machining line, it had 240 different machines, all, all automated, and cutting metal, drilling holes, all these types of things. You have a blip like that in the power, and all those machines go down, they run on about 29 to 30 second cycle times. You got tools stuck in machines, you got downtime, and it is a huge issue economically when you shut down an operation like that because it's just really a short blip in the power. It can be caused by a lot of different things. So the reliability of power, I think, in today's modern manufacturing facilities with all the sophisticated equipment that is, that goes in those operations, probably the reliability, cost is always going to be a factor. Uh, but I think the reliability is, is as important as anything else. Well, you know, we take for granted the reliability of uh, electricity. Uh, is that something we shouldn't take for granted? Well, we don't take it for granted in the manufacturing industry. You might take it for granted uh, here or maybe more so in somebody's house, like my power was off for two hours the other day in the house, but it didn't cause any big issues, right? But it'd be unheard of for the Toyota plant to have power off for two, two hours? Well, let us put it this way. Uh, there'd be a lot of people that would know about it. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> That's really not good. So we shut down the production line, an automobile vehicle assembly line. You shut it down for 30 minutes or an hour, it's big dollars. Plus, you have to make it up. So looking at the economic development situation, uh, and the, either the success or not success of the Toyota plant here, has it been a good thing, and does it bode well for other projects in Mississippi? Well, I think it does. I think it sets it. I think it shows off the quality of the workforce in this part of the state. I can't speak for the whole state, but it certainly shows off the quality of the workforce in, in North Mississippi. Uh, it's been a very successful project, uh, even after we were suspended when we decided to start it back up. We actually rolled the first car off 14 months after the announcement was made, which is the shortest time period ever. And then within a year, we actually had a major model change with the new Corolla. And no, no young plant that age has ever done that before. So it's been a very successful operation, but not without the help of an awful, and support of an awful lot of people. How would you compare the operation in Tupelo and the operation in West Virginia? Well, the operation, they were, they've both been successful. I mean, they really, they really, actually, we've never had an unsuccessful facility. <laughs> we really haven't. I don't know how much of that goes into the decision as to where we're going to put it or how much of that goes into the way, how hard we work once we get there. Good, good local management. <laughs> well, there's a lot of good local management. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but no, most of the, all of our plants have been successful. The West Virginia facility, uh, we expanded it five times in 10 years while I was there. Uh, and I was the first person on the ground there, and I was one of the first people on the ground here. So. I've done two startups, that's enough. Well, I'll tell you right. David, uh, you are on the point on economic development in uh, this area. Um, are you optimistic about the future? Uh, and if you are, why are you? Well, I am optimistic about the future. Uh, uh, David Copenhaver just mentioned that his expansions in Charleston, West Virginia. And, uh, certainly, we, we hope for those expansions to be part of the future of the Toyota plant in Bruce Springs, Mississippi. Uh, it was one of the reasons that you go after a major uh, assembly plant is because not only the supplier operations that will endure to the benefit of the community in, in education and, and, and job development, but also for that main plant to continue growth and development. I think you're producing 150, 160,000 units at this point for the Corolla. You know, that's, uh, you sell about a million units worldwide, so we've got a lot of room to room to grow potentially uh, in the future. And, uh, the comment Bill made about uh, the transition over the next 10 years, I think that's important because uh, affordable energy was a uh, factor in all of our plant locations and for them to be able to make a transition to uh, potentially higher costs of energy but reduce that by efficiency is critical for, for new plants and existing plants. Uh, you know, one of the things you don't want as a plant manager is your cost to increase and the cost of utilities is a is a cost along with labor and materials and other things, but you want to be able to stabilize and, and have a long-term horizon of affordability for those costs that you have, and utility costs are certainly one of those uh, one of those costs that you want to make sure that you have a good, positive 
a company. Uh, when I was in the electric business, everybody looked at electricity as a commodity, but more and more, it's more of a customized service, as David Copenhaver's talked about, because plants need quality power at reasonable rates to run efficiently and reliably, and that's the bottom line. And when that doesn't happen, it does affect the, the plant recruitment and plant retention for the future. Do you sell the TVA uh, when you're uh, approaching potential? Uh, uh, Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Uh, TVA is able to provide us with profiles on reliability, uh, and they're always in the upper 99 percentile range, and that is important to our companies that are looking at this area. Uh, electricity has become more uh, critical, as David Copenhavers mentioned, because of the automation in most modern factories. Not only do you not want to uh, shut down the line, but that cycle time, if you have a blip uh, in the cycle time. And so the alternative for a factory is to put in auxiliary power. Well, that's very expensive to put in auxiliary power to back up your utility. So most plants would rather have uh, major reliability from TBA, but TBA has been a great partner in that process of recruitment. And uh, they do a lot of other things that, besides just delivering the power efficiently and reliably but uh, that's that's a main concern for new plants and expansions people that are upgrading their cooper time rubber company uh, is another one that really is upgrading a lot of their equipment and all the new equipment uh, has an efficiency standard that requires reliable power 24 7 at a certain rate and condition josh uh, here in mississippi anyway alternate energy uh, supplies aren't necessarily at the head of the list when it comes to economic development that doesn't make it any more or less important. I know this is an area you spend a lot of time thinking about. What's your perspective on uh, the need for alternate energy sources here and how do you think that relates to economic development? Well, I think that um, I'm going to speak actually not just from my own research perspective, but for the university as a whole. Uh, because there's quite a diversified research portfolio um, of energy-related research going on here at the university. And it spans the gamut from uh, more uh, traditional um, fossil fuel type research with exploration uh, in the Gulf, uh, with subfloor uh, mapping of resources, um, the Mississippi Material um, Minerals uh, Research Institute uh, maintains large databases for uh, <clears throat> existing oil wells and uh, new types of shale deposits and things like that. Um, so that's sort of one end of the spectrum. Um, there's a lot of active work in, um, in biochars uh, and uh, biofuels, uh, alternative fuels um, uh, derived from uh, re renewable bio sources. Uh, and then getting more to the kind of research that, that uh, that I do is looking at um, alternative mechanisms for generating this energy, um, uh, which, you know, my view is that it's not going to be, we're not going to switch over, um, as Mr. Johnson said, we're not going to be switching over to all clean, all renewables anytime in the near future. But what I would like to see, and I think is feasible, is a, a gradual migration um, into an increased slice of that pie and the renewable uh, energy source for our overall energy portfolio. Um, so, and I think nuclear has a, has a role to play, that play there. I think it has an important role to play, and, and nuclear development um, has, has essentially stalled, um, and perhaps Mr. Johnson could speak more to that. Um, but one of the things we're looking at is working with um, uh, companies that are looking at next generation nuclear power plants and in the acoustic center for instance we're looking at ways to develop uh, health monitoring systems for safety and reliability of these uh, next generation nuclear power uh, cores. Well Josh you mentioned nuclear I think Bill when you forecast uh, 10 years out you said you thought you'd have about 40 percent nuclear which would be a little bit of an increase off of what it is now about seven percent or eight uh, percent. TVA has had a, a checkered history with nuclear. Uh, what do you, is it going to be increasing reliance on nuclear as people get more comfortable with it, or are people not going to get more comfortable with it? Are you likely to end up with another false start here, not through no fault of your own? I'll take the blame if it's mine. Uh, 
First, I should say, everybody who's in the nuclear business has a checkered history with it. So TVA is in the long you know, the history of starting plants, canceling them, the early history of not being able to operate them effectively. Uh, we're past most of that. We have a plant in Tennessee that we are going to finish sometime next year. We've been working on it since 1984, so it's had some stops and starts. Um, but the addition of that plant, and we can upgrade some of our existing plants. Um, we probably have another 1,600 megawatts, big units of electricity, which would take us to about 40%. The nuclear plant issue today is capital cost. You know, you're talking about if you start from scratch, six, seven, eight million dollars for a big plant. Uh, conventional gas plant the same size is a billion dollars. So it's the capital risk you take. If you make a mistake on that big capital risk, you pay for it for decades. So I think we're in a good spot with the one we're finishing because we're almost done. But the future of it uh, is cloudy. And one of the things that clouds it is that there's a decline in demand for electricity. And so in the past, you could always justify building big plants. You were growing 3 to 5% a year. That has changed dramatically nationwide. Well, as you know better than probably anybody in the room, public perception, uh, particularly on the part of government regulators and Congress, does have an impact on uh, nuclear. And uh, just when it looked like the country had gotten beyond Three Mile Island, uh, we have this uh, terrible situation in Japan. How much does that impact uh, the likely regulations that you're going to have to live with? I think we'll have some impact. Um, Actually, public perception of nuclear in the United States is back to where it was pre-Fukushima. So it's uh, generally about 70%, pretty positive here. Uh, there are going to be some regulations coming out of it. You know, what happened there is unlikely to happen anywhere here. We don't have tsunamis in the Tennessee River, um, hopefully. Um, but there will be some, some issues. I don't think the response to that is going to be a particularly expensive regulatory fix. Well, in terms of regulation, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, kind of gets into your business. Uh, I'm trying to find the right way to say that. And uh, they, they've issued some uh, de decrees, which you agreed with to kind of get them off your back, I guess. Uh, I guess the question is, is the EPA your friend or foe, and how do you expect to deal with them going forward? So uh, we're a member of the same family as EPA. So they're more like cousins than anything else. Um, you know, they're just doing their job, which is set out in the Clean Air Act. Uh, this administration clearly believes in climate change and believes that burning coal is having an impact on it. We'd like to reduce that. Uh, fair enough. So I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of problems with what they're doing, frankly. I mean, I personally believe that climate change is happening and that we have a it would be academics say anthropomorphic effect here that we're causing some of this. Um, and so, you know, we'll comply. Uh, we'll more than comply. Uh, if you are in a state, though, where you have 80% of your electricity comes from coal, the real issue is not the regulation, it's the cost impact on the consumer, right? And that's really what people are arguing about. But I think we'll be uh, okay. One of the reasons is we got kind of a head start on this a couple years ago with the EPA settlement. So we're in better shape than most folks. Without getting too much into the weeds, uh, the coal ash spill brought the EPA and you together, TVA together. <laughs> this happened before your watch. Uh, is there a reason for people in the region to be concerned about future coal ash spills or other environmental disasters from the TVA? Uh, no, let me be emphatic about that. No, um, that was a catastrophe. Uh, you should see the pictures now. The site is almost entirely cleaned up. You can't tell it ever happened. It did happen. Um, one of the things that TVA did after it happened was check the uh, stableness of all its impoundments. We've gone are going to dry fly ash, so we don't won't have ponds of ash anymore. But I think our situation. I think the lessons of Kingston were well learned at TVA. And uh, we don't ever want to do that again. So I think we've got our house in order on that. With the EPA seeming to be moving more towards some mandated uh, uh, percentages on alternative energy, you're getting there mainly by buying wind from the Midwest. Is there any, is there just not enough wind in Tennessee to support that? Or are there other strategies that would produce within the region 
the kind of alternative power you're going to need. So when you go outside here in the south in July and June and August and it's 100 degrees, there's nothing moving, there's no wind, and even the Congress can't make the wind blow. Hmm. So um, <laughs> this is not a wind-rich region, right? And so you get out in the plains, uh, Texas, those places, there's a lot of good wind, but this is not a really effective wind place, nor is a particularly effective solar. Uh, too much humidity, that's a whole different story. But, um, and so we don't have those kind of resources in the region. We have the river, so we get a lot of good renewable out of the river. Uh, but to the extent we're going to do that in a big way, we're going to have to import most of that from elsewhere. And just uh, one more thing on this, uh, the sources of energy. <clears throat> it, is, there, is there such a thing as clean coal? And uh, is coal really uh, quickly becoming a thing of the past? I don't think coal is becoming a thing of the past. You know, we, when they always call us the Saudi Arabia of coal, something like 300 years, coal is the second or third best fuel on the planet in terms of BTUs. Um, clean coal, yes. Uh, the technology exists. Southern Company is deploying it at Kemper County here, where you can gasify the coal, burn the gas, take the CO2 stream off. And then the question is, what do you do with it? So you can inject it into oil wells, um, it's a very expensive process. Those plants today cost as much or more than a new nuclear plant. And so the economics haven't worked out yet. And then when we get the economics worked out, we have a ton of land issues. When we start pumping CO2 into the ground, there's a whole regime of state property laws that... So I think we're, you know, that's a decade away at least, I would think. David, how much, David Rumbarger, how much is... Uh environment uh, an issue as you woo prospective uh, industrial? It's probably been the uh, fastest growing issue in the last 10 years uh, because it's, uh, it involves the industry, its waste stream, uh, how they treat the land, um, how they develop the site, uh, water retention, and it's all in dovetailed with EPA and other guidelines, but uh, responsible industries have taken proactive steps uh, during the recruitment process, and we answer probably double the environmental questions that we did 10 years ago, uh, not only on sites, but on processes and uh, recycling opportunities, disposal opportunities, uh, and waste stream reduction. Uh, it's very apparent. Toyota, in their location process, uh, was the first time in Mississippi's history that we had cleared and grubbed a site without any type of burn. Uh, typically in Mississippi what we would do is if it was a site that we were going to clear and the, the waste stream of, of non-productive uh, trees and, and flora and fauna would be burned. And Toyota said we don't want to do that. Uh, and so the state prepared that site and all of that was either uh, harvested lumber or it was barked for mulch or it was ground for uh, fuel. And so every piece of the vegetation on that 1,500 or 1,700 acre site in Blue Springs was disposed of in an environmentally, environmentally responsible manner, which was the first time we'd ever done such a large site in the state of Mississippi. So is that a lot more expensive? About three times the cost. Yeah. Yeah. David, you've been involved with economic development all around the South. What keeps the uh, southern states from uh, cannibalizing one another? <laughs> in the cost of incentives. Um, when you, I don't know what you actually mean by cannibalizing well, each other. You know, you said it, the incentives, wars, uh, that uh, just kind of... Well, economic <coughs> developers would tell you, I, when, I, when I first started the economic development in 72, the incentives wasn't even in the picture. And if you talk to most folks that have been in the business uh, over the last 20 years, they would tell you they would love it if there was no such thing as an incident. Are these the state people or the... Everybody. Everybody. <coughs> everybody. Well, well, but the only way you're ever going... You, you, it's not, that's not going to happen. It's unrealistic to think that they're ever going to go away. But it's not something so much that economic development professionals created, that they had to work within it. And then they have to go out and they have to sell uh, their local officials and their state officials that it's a competitive factor in economic development, and they may not like it, but it's there. And there have been some states that have bucked it, and those states have lost. North Carolina, for a long time, North Carolina, when I was there, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't even 
think about getting the sentence. It's one of the reasons the Mercedes plant didn't go to North Carolina and went to Alabama. So in that respect, if you take that one example, incentives do work. Oh, they work. But they're expensive. They cost money. They don't make a bad deal good. Right. But they actually help locate a good deal. And that's what most states and municipalities attempt to recruit is the good deal, which is a balance of investment and jobs. Well, I asked Bill to look 10 years ahead on energy sources. I asked the two of you to look 10 years ahead in economic development. Uh, incentives up, down, a, a change in strategy by states to lure people in. What's going to be, what's the milieu over the next 10 years? I think they'll become more sophisticated in how they analyze them because they've done that a lot in the last 10 to 15 years. Like David said, you know, uh, incentives do not make a bad deal a good deal. They really don't. They can enhance a good deal. And you can, if you can figure out what your return on the investment, the states and the municipalities and even some of the private organizations make it a project, then if you get a, if you're, you, and then you have to just say, well, is that a good return I'm getting off of my investment or not? Uh, but that's changed a lot. And I just think that's going to become more sophisticated in the modeling and, and the way that they analyze it. And it's because you have to, because you, I think Toyota got right at $300 million uh, for the incentive package uh, in the state of Mississippi here, and we got almost $200 million from our project in West Virginia, which was a lot smaller to start with. But <clears throat> the studies will show that the benefits far outweigh the return on investment of those dollars is really very good uh, because of the you know, stability in the jobs, wages that the jobs pay, eventually the taxes that the companies pay. Uh, Toyota is also a cash uh, flow to the government, just like TVA is. Which incentive meant the most to Toyota? I'm sorry? Which incentive meant the most to Toyota? <coughs> I don't think there was any one incentive that meant the most to Toyota. The whole package. It was basically the whole package. And I don't think an incentive ever really attracts a company. I think an incentive helps the company make a decision because Eventually, m most projects, they'll come down to four, five, or six locations that the economics work out, the labor force is there, da da da, and all that kind of stuff. And if, once that becomes pretty much equalized, then the incentives can play a big role in what's the final location decision. Well, and cycle times have, have really shrunk. Uh, we used to see a cycle time for a, a project to be a year to 18 months, and now... Cycle meaning the decision the, time? The point between when you're contacted and when a decision's made to locate. Uh, companies spend a lot more time. They could plan a little bit better because the economy was a little more uh, uh, sustainable and complete in its focus on the long-term development. But today, uh, a six-month cycle time is, is a long time. And so what that does is it drives communities and states back to product development. And that's where TVA has been so integral in really helping communities and states through uh, both their local uh, recruitment arms and development arms like North Mississippi Industrial Development Association and TVA staff. They had a mega site project that helped us in 2002, 2003 identify the site and then began to focus on that and actually marketed the site for us nationally as we developed the site ourselves here in Mississippi. So that's the kind of partnership we talk about in economic development, which is not just delivering kilowatts, it's actually helping communities sustain and improve themselves on a long-term basis. And that cycle time, uh, if you're going to compete, uh, you probably won't get a first call. The first call is actually on the internet. So if you don't have an available site that's that, that criteria, then you will be cut before you even know it. So communities aren't competing because they don't know they're not competitive, but they have to have that 50, 100, whatever the, the company needs as far as a facility. Uh, they have to have an available site that's ready to go, and they can't wait uh, five and 10 months for utilities and infrastructure to go there. It has to be there. And that's, that's been a challenge for local governments because there's not a whole lot of investment on the front end in those types of projects. There's not a lot of tax money that's, that's gathered that says it can be uh, attributed to speculative land or industrial parks that aren't full. Mm -hmm. and that's been an issue. So I think that's going to be my the coming issue in the next 10 years for economic development is how do you become more prepared for the projects that you want to recruit when you don't know all the specifications but you want to be in the game. 
So we hadn't mentioned the word education. Uh, David, how much was education an issue in solving North Mississippi? Education is an issue on every project um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, some of the reasons are because you need an educated workforce to work in today's facilities versus 30 years ago in a cotton mill. wasn't quite the same education requirement. So from that standpoint, it's important. But the other part of it that's important is all of your, uh, your team, uh, you know, they have kids. They're interested in their kids getting a good education. So if you're trying to recruit people in or retain people, Keep them in the area. Uh, education, so education is, is is economic development, in my opinion. They go hand in hand. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, North Mississippi, uh, we had no drawbacks with the education system that we saw uh, at all. And uh, so it's been it's it, it, it's been good. Josh, I've asked everybody about the future. I hadn't asked you. Uh, you think physics is something that would stay the same, but we know from Nobel Prize winners, I'm out of a job. Nobel Prize winners and others, a lot of change in physics. But looking ahead in your area, what changes do you see? Well, I, I think there's, well, for probably the past 10 years or so, uh, maybe longer, there's been a, an increasing push uh, toward the materials side of physics, uh, materials physics, materials science and engineering. And, um, and part of that is exactly a lot of the things that we've been talking about here. Finding smarter, more efficient materials, more robust materials that allow for, for instance, uh, parts to last twice as long. Well, that's, uh, you know, co costs companies less to replace parts. It costs less energy because you don't have to make so many parts. So all that ties in. Um, so I, I think that there, that's going to continue, that the, the effort uh, in materials, science and engineering, and physics um, will, uh, will continue and, and probably accelerate. I think that's one of the biggest areas applied to the conversation that we're having here uh, in physics. Good. I want to go to the audience to get any questions that you might have. But first, I want to ask uh, Bill a question. I was thinking about your job. Bill, you got the seven or eight southern states all in the area of economic development uh, competing and buying. And you're kind of like the, uh, uh, the uh, head of the Southeastern Conference, uh, where you've got all these good football teams that are warring with each other, but the head of the Southeastern Conference is looking out supposedly for everybody. And in terms of economic development, how do you uh, uh, balance off the uh, factions and the competition and try to help every do you try to help everybody equally and how does that play out yeah so there is a little competition amongst the various states and communities i will say there's a lot more collaboration than there is competition one of the things that has really struck me about my time here is the partnership aspect of this and david rumbar was talking some about this the tva with the local community with the development agency in the region with the government we play straight down the middle I mean, our goal is jobs and prosperity in the valley, and so we we play right down the middle. But I would say the competition is not as visible to us as it might be to those competing directly, because the people really work at this collaboratively. I've been really impressed with that. Competition is healthy in the economic development. Mm -hmm. So even within the same state, even within the same state, mm -hmm. here it is. Okay. okay, we got a lot of smart people out here in the audience. Uh, let's uh, have a question or two. Yes, sir. All right, so we've got the large EPA settlement that's very favorable to the EPA. Uh, so let's, let's think about TVA is not a regulated utility. So how is this going to affect the ability to recruit industry to the south, to the Tennessee Valley region? Uh, I mean, rates have to go up somewhere to cover these costs. Are you going to raise rates on residential consumers? Are you going to raise rates on industry? Uh, so how are you going to square this problem? And you know, how do you compete against private utilities that maybe haven't been hit by these settlements as hard? Yeah, so the EPA settlement, I wasn't here for it. I don't know that I would describe it in your words. Um, everybody who has coal operations sooner or later is going to have the same issues that we resolved in the EPA settlement. You're going to have to scrub them, you're going to have to put bag houses on them, you're going to have to control them, or you're going to have to retire them. And actually, I think we're in a pretty good position because we got started on this a couple years before most people. Um, 
I don't necessarily think we're going to have to raise rates a lot to deal with this. Um, we are in a period where we have more generation assets than we need. Uh, the efficiency in technology and other things, the economy, all have driven demand down. So we have a five or seven year window where we have too many assets. And so we will be closing assets instead of investing a billion dollars. It'll go something like this. You have an old coal plant that's 60 years old. It's got a $100 million book value. And it costs you a billion dollars to scrub it. Uh, fortunately, we're not going to have to deal with that question because we don't need those assets. So my goal and TVA's goal is uh, quite simple, that we have plenty of power, that it continues to be competitively low priced, that it's cleaner every day, and that we can really use this to do what we're supposed to be doing, which is economic development. So I think, I think we're on a good path here to continue to help recruit industry and jobs, to help improve the environment and keep those rates low. So for a layman like me, uh, is this overcapacity, if that's what it's called, would be called, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, could be both. It's certainly an opportunity where we are to control our costs. Uh, in a lot of places, if you have more capacity than you need, you can sell it into the market around you. We have some pretty severe limitations on that. Uh, so if you're in a different business model, it would be a great benefit. For us, it presents an opportunity to manage our costs, manage our assets, keep our rates low. Other questions? Yes? Natural gas is uh, entered the market in the last number of years to try to provide the fuel for electric generating plants and companies and co. Backed off a little bit, but now with the gas prices as low as they are. Uh, do you see that as still a uh, Emerging market for natural gas? Yes, so natural gas, I can remember about five years ago, it was a dwindling resource. If you were in the market, you could get a one year contract. Uh, 18 months later, we we're washing gas and it's cheap. Uh, then it went up a little, but if you look at the projections, including the EIA, we see four to $6 gas for the next 20 years. Under $6, you're in the money as a fuel. And so I think what you will see nationwide is uh, for people that need to build generation, it's going to be almost all gas. For, and I think this is probably a 20-year phenomenon, something like that. Maybe in that 20 years, our renewables become more cost efficient. Uh, so I think this is a good bridge kind of strategy for about 20 years. Bill, uh, you know, your job is complex under the best of circumstances, but when you add all the uh, factors in that you have little or no control over. It makes it seem almost impossible to somebody like me. Um, one of the things that just boggles my mind is the inefficiency and the long time inefficiency of the grid. Uh, and everybody talks about the need to improve the grid, but uh, is there any uh, hope that that will happen in our lifetime? So when you hear that talk about the grid, you have to focus on who's saying it to you. Because uh, the facts about the current grid are it is highly reliable. It's the most reliable electricity grid in the world. Um, but it was not designed to do what people want it to do today. It was designed as an interstate, an intrastate highway system, right? So you had plants around it, and you served that area. Now what people would like to do is import from the west, move power to the west, the system really wasn't built for that. So if that's what the plan is, we're going to have to spend a lot of money to change the system. But, and David said this, you know, for 14 years in a row, we have put up five nines of reliability, almost six sigma, on that grid. So it's a pretty reliable, depending on what you want it to do. <laughs> so if you're looking at it more as a state or regional grid, then it's pretty efficient. Yeah. If you're looking at it as a national grid, not so efficient. That's exactly right. Well, I might distinguish between efficiency and reliability mm -hmm. because I, um, you know, the efficiency, you've got a lot of losses pumping electricity over long distances. This is where your material science is going to help. <laughs> uh, I, I think that is an area, and I think I think in the Chicago area they put in a, a power transmission line that was superconducting, if I'm not mistaken, some years ago, uh, which would take those losses down to almost zero cost some money to keep it cold for sure. So I don't want to tell you how long I've been in the business, but I, 
today we suffer about 6% loss of the energy over the line if you just lose it. Um, I can remember it was 12%. And the cost of going from 12% to 8 or 7% was reasonable. The cost of going from 6% to 4% is prohibitive until we have a different technology or something. That's really why we're stuck about where we are. Josh, is the key to that putting it, putting it underground? No, that really won't change anything. Um, there are some uh, advantages to reliability, I'm sure, as far as putting it on ground, but as far as efficiency, it really does. It, it's really completely a materials question. Uh, what, what's the resistivity of that material? And that will just tell you in simple calculation how much money you're going to lose um, by pumping it from here to there. Good. Other questions? Go right ahead, sir. All right, so it seems like there's a move to uh, private ownership of the TDA through organizations like Sunny States and then the recent offers by guys like Haney to rebuild the Elephant. So is, is that the future of the TDA is to deal more in these lease agreements to take advantage of outside financing to keep that cost low? Yeah, so the financing is a little arcane. I should explain this. TDA went. It stopped getting appropriations. Um, Congress passed a, a law that says you have a statutory debt cap of $30 billion. Now, there are other forms of debt that don't count under the $30 billion. So we have done some financing of, say, billion-dollar assets through alternative financing. It's a little more expensive. It still shows up in the balance sheet, but it doesn't count in the statutory. Um, our objective is to, over the next 10 years, bend our spending down, bend our debt levels down, and do everything we can to use our own debt capacity under that $30 billion cap to build our projects. That's really where we're focused. There have been some privatization discussions from Cohen's <coughs> budget and these others. Um, TVA's cost of money is quite cheap. And so if we can do this on our own debt, it's the best answer for all the consumers in the region. So. That would be our best plan, bend our spending down, bend our debt down, use our own debt capacity to fund our activities. David, should we expect to see any projects of the magnitude of Toyota coming into this region uh, in the next few years? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think evidence of that is, uh, you know, Yokohama deciding to go to West Point, uh, Clay County. Uh, everybody thought that, you know, that wouldn't happen, but uh, it was able to happen. And, and really, we don't know the... Uh, the, the nature of some of the, the newer plants that are looking around the globe as we become a more global society. Uh, half of my projects are international now. Uh, I couldn't say that even 10 years ago. And uh, international locations, people are looking for the best location around the globe to put a plant together. Uh, one of the benefits of recruiting at Toyota uh, was the spinoff effect. We think of it just as jobs or capital. But uh, the Center for Manufacturing Excellence here at Ole Miss is a direct uh, descendant of that Toyota location to try to change the, the manufacturing landscape within our region. And as that changes, our workforce becomes more intelligent in the way they do it. The products that are produced are, are higher efficiency, uh, more technologically based, and uh, you just continue that ramp up. So I, I fully expect us to have more of those large plant locations in the future, whether they're tires or automobiles or, or other consumer products. So talk a little bit more about the center here at Ole Miss. Do you bring people over here to look at it? Uh, Absolutely. It's one of our, our great attractions as we talk to especially foreign-based companies because uh, they, they understand manufacturing. Uh, a lot of them run a version of the Toyota production system, which has become worldwide a standard for production in uh, David can talk more about what that is, but it's really a measurement and a process to eliminate waste and to maximize effort both in labor and resources uh, to produce a product. But uh, the Center for Manufacturing Excellence here, the Haiti Barber Center that was just named, is, uh, it is now a, a blending of business and engineering into the manufacturing or technology process. And that is very unique around the, the country. It was something that uh, really uh, I think both Governor Barber and a lot of the Toyota officials and a lot of the local economic developers said, hey, this is something that's needed. We've got business people who don't understand manufacturing. We've got engineers who understand manufacturing but don't understand business. And they have been able to uh, put a cadre of classes together, now four, 
uh, I guess the class will be graduating in the <coughs> spring will be the first senior class graduating. Mm -hmm. They'll have a hybrid uh, opportunity to improve manufacturing within the region, hopefully here in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. David, it wasn't that long ago when manufacturing was almost a bad word, or at least uh, not seen as something that was going to ever be very good for the United States or uh, down here in the South. Well, how, how do you account for the change? <clears throat> a lot of ingenuity. Uh, and a lot of smart people uh, thinking smarter, getting smarter, doing things smarter. Uh, certainly some of the equipment design has, has made a big difference in improving efficiency. Uh, granted, it was cut down uh, the labor content in a project is not what it used to be, typically. 20 years ago, if you went to an assembly plant for what we have out at Blue Springs, you might have 3,000 people out there instead of 2,000. So a lot of that has been efficiency and automation come about but <clears throat> when you're in a competitive marketplace you've got to figure out some ways to keep the cost down because believe it or not dealers in Toyota do not decide what the price of an automobile is the customer does and so throughout the automotive industry that's why we're always talking about controlling cost and cutting cost because if you look at the over the last 10 years at the price of base price of automobiles it's flat it's just been as flat as it can be but I think that's not just that's not just the automotive industry. That's all of the kind of manufacturing. <clears throat> we used to talk about high tech manufacturing. I used to say if you're in manufacturing, you're in high tech because you can't make it any other way. Mm -hmm. And now that's changed from high tech manufacturing to advanced manufacturing. I don't know what the next buzzword is going to be for it, but I'm sure we'll come up with something. Uh, but all of those things have made uh, the products uh, more competitive. The other reason especially on consumer products. Logistics is probably one of the highest costs that we have, at least in the automotive industry, and I'm sure it's the same in other industries. Um, and so it's much more beneficial to build the product as close to where you can sell the product and bring the suppliers who also, those logistic costs, we pay for them. It's just built into the piece price. So we're paying for that too. Bring them as close as you can to knock down logistics costs. Logistics costs in the automotive industry is probably still the lowest hanging fruit that there is for helping to control costs in the automotive industry. Other questions? Yes, sir. I wonder if David could characterize which David? In the middle. The level of education that it would typically take to work on the Toyota assembly line. That's a good question. We don't. We, we never required even a high school education. But you've got to be able to read. You have to be able to follow directions. You have to be able to communicate, and you have to be able to think as a problem solver. Because that's really what the Toyota production system is all about. And so, you know, we can take. Uh, we have a lot of high school graduates that work on the production line. We have a lot of college graduates that work on the production line. Um, but, but you've got to at least have a high school, in my opinion, a high school level of education and to be able to perform at a high school graduate level. Or you won't make it. You just won't, you just, you just won't make it. Because it's not, it's, not it's, not, it's not like manual work like you think about it used to be. You know, it's, it's reading and adjusting a machine. Uh, there's some manual labor obviously involved, but it's trying to find out where is the problem? Why are we taking, instead of the 56 seconds it is at this process, why are we taking 65 seconds? So you have to go through, and that's problem solving. So the people have got to be able to think and work together. So how long does it take to build a car from start to finish over there? Oh, from very well, it's, it's hard, I can't, I can't really tell you that, because I'm gonna I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why I can't tell you that. I can tell you how long it takes a car to come off the assembly line. Uh, <clears throat> well, they, they come off the assembly line and it, it, every 78 seconds. We will get that, we'll, we'll improve that before uh, time. We have some assembly plants where the, the, the Camry, for example, we have a Camry line that comes off every 55 seconds. And uh, we had transmissions that came off every 33 seconds. It was so it's, it's great. 
Any uh, last questions? Well, uh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see over here. Yes, sir. I'm a historian. I'm interested in uh, TBA's history as kind of paralleling the changing meaning of an academic, economic development even is in some ways. And of course, what we started out with was this quote from Roosevelt about the kind of community commitment and what the purpose really is. And I just wonder, as economic times and philosophies have been changing, how much of that commitment to development in the old sense, benefiting the population in the Tennessee Valley and beyond, is still left? Or can you really afford to still kind of think about, given that you have to shut plants, as you said earlier? Is that, how important is that still in your kind of daily thinking about It's the most important. And not just to me, but to, I think, almost everybody who works at TVA. Uh, it doesn't take you long to figure out really what this is about, which is exactly what you described, which is economic development in the big sense. Uh, I'm sure over the years it's ebbed and flowed, just like everything else, but that is a core commitment and a core interest of the organization that uh, I don't think we will ever deviate from. Yes? Um, it, it costs money to bring power from, from the source to the location for the new industry. Who, who puts that bill? Well, we try to slough it off on Tupelo. <laughs> they call the governor. <laughs> it depends. Frequently, this question is part of the package of incentives that's discussed, so maybe I'll throw it over to David here. It depends. Well, it's a capacity issue. Uh, in our industrial parks, uh, we've built industry over a period of, in our South Park, over 50 years. And so the, you know, the first transformer was bought there to power the first company, and then it grew from that point. And we're always pitching back to TVA and to our local suppliers to not just meet the needs of the next company, but to provide extra capacity. And you can to buffer that to an extent. I mean, who pays for that extra capacity? Well, if a, um, you know, a 1,250 kV transformer is $1,100 and 1,500 is only uh, 1250 then that's just another $150 at the time you put it in. You still have the labor cost of installing it, running the uh, wires to it, and then electrifying it. So we, we try to cheat at the corners, they say, a little bit to, to get that capacity up and so that the next person in has capacity. Uh, the physical capabilities uh, for like a Toyota plant is in the package, uh, in, the, in the package, and then it's also in a facility charge that is charged to, to the customer over a period of time, amortized. So it's a combination of both. Water and sewer is a different uh, source because usually those are municipally driven. So those are uh, community development block grants if it's not a relocation from another state or other types of uh, funding. There's a, uh, uh, Mississippi has a sewer and water fund that can be accessed at the state level. So uh, we piece those things together. Uh, the local community <coughs> also is responsible for that, not only the so providers, but uh, boards of supervisors for local communities uh, to develop those parks. It's back to the question about being prepared. Uh, if you don't have a 50-acre site with water, with sewer, with access to rail, with access to a major four-lane, uh, you know, the, the days of a bean field and Farmer Brown are gone. Uh, you know, that's not what prospects are looking for. Prospects are convincing that time frame. If you can give them two or three months on the front of that time frame and buy that time for them, that's a value in the marketplace. Uh, plus, it just gets you uh, to be competitive, then you get a chance to compete. David and David and Josh and Bill, thank you for an informative and forward-looking conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh.